Okay, thanks, Jenny. And and um, so just to go over again, so Ben Sutherland, I'm the principal food technologist for Food Standards Australia New Zealand, and as Jenny mentioned, um, based here in Wellington, and that is Wellington, New Zealand, not Wellington, New South Wales. Um, so I'm quite happy to present on this um, dairy manufacturing webinar program. So Jenny approached me late last year. So look, always happy to help out um, the dairy industry and. Um, as Jenny alluded to before, so one of my hobbies as, as well as my job is to bridge that regulatory gap between um, industry and regulation because, you know, from my experience in the food industry, you, you, you're flat out doing what, whatever you're doing, whether it be product development or QA, and, and so it doesn't leave a lot of time to um, look into regulatory aspects. So um, hopefully today I'll be able to send you all off for the, with a bit more knowledge on the regulation in particular uh, of novel foods. So just an overview of today's talk. So I'll talk about what novel foods actually are. We'll look at the current regulations. We'll look at the pre-market assessment process. Uh, as Jenny mentioned, the code needs to be uh, amended via an application or a proposal. So I'll talk about those two different aspects later on in, in the um, webinar. I'll speak about the Advisory Committee on Novel Foods. And I've got a couple of case studies which I thought might be interesting and then just some further follow-up information. Okay, so what are novel foods? So the Food Standard Code defines novel foods and, and that def defini definition is um, that non-traditional foods are foods that require an assessment of public health and safety before they can be added to the food supply. So as you can imagine, there are lots of weird and wonderful foods out there and, and they may be used uh, anywhere in the world for different purposes or ceremonial purposes, but they don't have a history of safe use in this region being Australia and New Zealand. Novel foods can include pure chemicals, uh, GM foods um, and other whole foods among others. So an assurance of safety and nutritional quality of the food supply are key reasons why we regulate novel foods. And just on that um, term, non-traditional food. So non-traditional food means a food, a substance derived from food or any other substance that does not have a history of human consumption in Australia. As I mentioned, they may have been used overseas for, for generations uh, for certain purposes, um, but they won't have a, a history of safe use in this region. And so there's various categories of novel foods. So we've got plants or animal animals or their components, plant or animal extracts. There's herbs, including extracts. So extracts can be taken from plants by solvent extraction, for example, dehydration. And the main issue with this is that they may be many times concentrated. So for example, they might have um, anti-nutrients in them or um, plant toxins. And, and so if an extract is made, those components, um, as well as the active component or the beneficial component, they get concentrated as well. And so the exposure would be many more times than what would occur naturally in nature. Uh, there are dietary macro components, uh, single chemical entities, microorganisms, which might be of interest to the dairy industry, including probiotics. And so novel foods not only um, concern the food itself, but also foods produced from new sources or by new processes. So as far as the current regulations go, so um, they're contained within the Australian New Zealand Food Standards Codes. So part 1.5, um, that lists out the foods requiring pre-market clearance. So there are various standards within part 1.5. So there's standard 1.5.1, which is novel foods. 1.5.2, which is food produced using gene technology or GM foods. Uh, interestingly enough, there's about 80 GM foods permitted in this region. And standard 1.5.3 is irradiation of food. And there's, there's a, 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 each standard has an associated schedule. So the schedule that's associated to standard 1.5.1 uh, is schedule 25 permitted novel foods. And so what that does is that's the a schedule that lists, it has a table and it lists the, um, the novel food and the conditions under which it may be used. And there's some examples as alpha and gamma cyclodextrin, this DHA-rich microalgal oil, 
isomitral O's, phytosterols. Um, there was a recent application for use in plant-based milks, and, and traditionally they've been used in uh, margarine, d tagatose triolose, and rapeseed protein isolate, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. And so I'll take you through the pre-market assessment process. So standard 1.5.12 requires that a pre-market assessment covers the following things. So we need to look at the potential for adverse effects in humans. So this can either be um, from actual humans actually consuming the food, um, or it can be we can extrapolate that from things such as rodent trials. So in a lot of our assessments, we, we look at the rodent trials and um, yeah, we can extrapolate the um, exposure to humans from, from them. We look at the composition or the structure of the food. We look at the process by which the food has been prepared the source from which it is derived. And then we also look at the patterns and levels of consumption of the foods. For example, we'll do a dietary exposure um, assessment on um, any new food ingredient that comes into the food supply and any other relevant matters. And so during our pre-market assessment process, we apply the Codex Risk Analysis Framework. So there's three segments there. So the risk assessment comprises of toxicology. So maybe a plant toxin, for example, uh, food technology. So how is the um, ingredient made? How is it processed? Um, and um, is, the, is the process itself a novel process? We look at the nutrition of the ingredient, of the novel food. Uh, and we also look at uh, if there's a benefit or efficacy of a novel food. So obviously, if you want to add a novel food, it, um, there's a reason for adding it. And, and so that needs to be proven as well. So um, and generally, you can't just um, want to um, have a novel food permitted because it sounds good or it looks good on the label. It actually, it has to have a function. Uh, we do dietary exposure on the particular food. So, or if it's an ingredient, the range of foods that it would be added to in the food supply. And we also look at the consumer and economic benefits of it. So uh, does it mean that the consumer has more of a choice in, in the foods they can choose or uh, are there other benefits um, that they might get from that ingredient being included? And economic as well. So is there a benefit for industries? So for example, um, would it make the raw materials uh, cheaper or, or can it improve a processing and create some efficiencies um, and therefore some savings for either industry or, um, or consumers. And so once the risk is assessed, we, we undertake the risk management. And so there's various ways we can do that. So for example, we can set specifications for a novel food. And so, as I mentioned before, in Schedule 25, there, there, there it lists the novel food and the conditions of, of use. So also in the code, we have Schedule 3, which is uh, the schedule for identity and purity. So any new novel food will have a specification in there. And of course, that will cover all the physical and, and micro parameters. Um, and so that shows that only an ingredient that meets that specification uh, can be used. We can look at the use levels, for example, um, if the margins of exposure uh, exceeded the, the safe threshold, we can reduce the level so that the consumers aren't exposed to uh, dangerous levels of a food. We can consign it to different food classes. So in Schedule 15 of the code, there are different food classes that cover all types of foods. Um, so we can, we can um, categorise it into several food classes some, some foods can be used in any food, um, but others can only be used in specific foods. Then there's labelling. So labelling might include things such as uh, allergen labelling or there's other um, warning labelling such as uh, we have with polyols not to consume 50 grams of more of those a day to avoid uh, the laxation effect, things like that. So that there are many sort of warning labelings or advisory labels that, that can be put on products. And if it's a novel food, we can come up with a new um, advisory label. Advice, we can provide advice on our website. So our website has over 3,000 pages of information. So if anyone out there listening today gets stuck or has a question, by all means go onto our website and go to the little search bar in the top right-hand corner and, and type something in. If you can't find it, uh, get in touch with me. My details are coming up later on. 
And in some instances, we, we can put out a code of practice. And so that's for industry. And, and so pretty much that's a 101 of how to use this ingredient. And we also do risk communication. So risk communication is, is how we, how we um, put the information out there. So do we put it on our website? And um, sometimes that's all we do. Or do we publish it? Or do we send it out to specific groups? Or do we engage with groups? So there's many types of uh, risk communication. And that's all dependent on the, the uh, extent of the risk. Okay, so I'll take you through the pre-market assessment process. So... If you listen to one slide today, let this be the slide. Um, so the, the code is changed by either an application or a proposal. So this is the application process. So the application process is, is uh, made by an individual or a, uh, or, or a company. So that differs from a proposal, which is raised by Fizan. So for example, if Fizan sees a, a, a risk in the food supply, we can raise a proposal. Uh, to manage that risk. So we've got quite a few proposals on our books at the moment. That we're, we're, we've got proposals on infant formula, um, caffeine in the food supply, um, alcohol labelling, and all, all sorts of things. Um, but an application is something that's been submitted to us um, from either in the industry, as I said, uh, or an individual. Okay, let's start at the, the black arrow there. So, so this is quite important, this one, pre-application assistance. So like we're quite open to um, people coming to talk to us, e either on a casual basis or if you see us at a conference, just hit one of us up. And uh, look, we're happy to talk through the application process. Um, it's quite involved. So for someone who hasn't made an application before, uh, we do recommend that uh, they um, find a consultant uh, to, to work on that for them. And the good thing is about all of our work that it's the visibility is there on our website. So you can always go into our website and look at other applications that have been made in the past to get, get a feel for what, um, what is required. So we point people in the right direction and we have what's called an application handbook. So the application must meet all of those conditions. So for a novel food, uh, there are certain sections of that application handbook that need to be addressed. So there's a general section which contains all the general information about the food, what, it's, what it will be used for, and um, the applicant, all those sorts of things. And then it also has another section on novel foods specifically, where that really goes into the detail of the, of the composition of the food, how it will be used, how it is manufactured, those sorts of things. And so this blue arrow here, so this is when the application is submitted. So we do advise that applicants submit a draft application. And so what we do with the draft applications is we, we have a um, quick look at it and that might take oh, in the uh, region of three weeks. And so our staff do that in our spare time. And we can make comment on that. And we go back to that, we can say, oh, look, um, this bit is missing or you might like to add another bit here or you might need to tidy up this bit. So it's really good because once we um, receive an application, we only, we only have two choices and that's to accept it and reject it. And if it's not up to scratch, unfortunately, we have to reject it. And so that's why that pre-application assistance is so important. So once we receive it here, um, we've got, we carry out what's called an admin assessment report. And so we've got a statutory timeline of 15 days. So that's from the day we receive it, we have 15 days for our staff to go through and we get the technical experts for each um, area. So the microbiologists, the toxicologists and, and so forth. So they go through the application and just ensure it meets the, the requirements set out in the application handbook. And so once we get here, we, we have that 15 days, we say, okay, well, we'll accept the application or we will reject it. And so we don't reject many, which is, which is good um, because you know, one of our reasons for being here is to support innovation. And so once we accept it, we, what happens is the clock starts. And again, we have a statutory timeline, which, um, which goes along here. So it can be either a major or a general procedure. So a general procedure is around about nine months for the assessment and a major could be 12 months or more. And so we're not, that time there starts from the stop clock, which is when we accept the application until the, this part here where the board has um, 
reviewed our recommendation. So we do our assessment in this area here, which involves the risk assessment and risk management I spoke about before. And all of our applications have a consultation program, uh, process. So that goes out uh, to a public call for submission. So we put out the uh, an SD or a scientific document. So we put out all the science behind it and the call for submissions document. And, and so, and that pretty much spells out what the, the new food might be, how it will be used. And we ask for comments. So what do people support it? Are they against it? And those sorts of things. So that would be a six week period of consultation there. And so once the consultation closes, uh, we write our final approval report and that goes to the Fazans board. So they meet about eight times a year. And so all we're doing in this instance is the Fazans staff are, are, are making an assessment of uh, an ingredient and whether it's safe and, and should be permitted into, into the food supply. And so we put that recommendation to the board and the board make the final decision. And so once the board have considered it, uh, they, they will either, either approve it, and in most instances they do approve it. In some instances they actually ask for some minor changes or some clarification on some points. And so if the board accept it, then what happens, it goes to the food minister's meeting. And these, uh, it's probably about six of those years. So these are the Australian and New Zealand food ministers, one from uh, New Zealand and eight from Australia. And they meet on a regular basis. Uh, and so what happens, our recommendation goes to the board and the board board's recommendation goes to them. And if they have no questions or they don't see any concerns, um, the food gets um, approved for Gazettal. And so that period between the board assessing our recommendation and the food ministers is they have to respond to us within 60 days. So you can see there that if you submitted an application, um, if it was a nine month uh, from here to here, it's another two months. So we generally say it's about 12 months uh, for as a rule of thumb to get an ingredient um, approved. Oh, and there's one thing I missed actually, and that is up here. So that could be paid or unpaid. So I'll just obviously, uh, it's pretty obvious on on the face of it. But um, by paying it, what that does is that expedites the start date. So that brings the start date forward. So if it was unpaid, uh, we have quite a few unpaid applications on our book. So we give them a number, and then they just sit there in numerical order until we have time. Uh, for the staff to start. So for example, if someone made an unpaid application today, the waiting time would be around about 12 months. And once we start it, that nine month uh, process still, still applies, um, but if it's paid, um, as soon as we receive the money, we start. And, and so you can expedite it. You can bring it forward a year by paying. And in a certain circumstance, it, it needs to be paid. So if there's an exclusive capture, uh, capturable benefit for the applicant, then it must be a paid application. So I'll talk about the Advisory Committee on Novel Food. So this is a committee that provides opinions on whether a food ingredient or a component of a food is, is novel or not. Um, I might say here that advice is not legal advice, so it's, it's only a view. And so not all, all inquiries will produce a recommendation from the committee. Even after considering an inquiry, the committee may require more information about it, particularly if there's not enough information available to provide a recommendation. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite often that some um, inquiries that are submitted don't actually make it to the record of views. And so the advisory committee on novel foods it comprises of Fazan scientists and enforcement agencies. So that's a veritable who's who of the food regulation um, in New Zealand and Australia. So you, you couldn't have a better um, group of people looking at your product. And um, so they meet... Oh, probably about six or seven times a year, depending on how busy they get. They can always have more meetings depending on the number of inquiries we get. The opinions are published on the Fazan's website. Um, so the person that makes the inquiry needs to understand this because in some instances, of course, things are confidential. So uh, they, they might not approach us. So, um, but there are other ways of finding out whether um, an application is needed. It's voluntary, so you don't have to do it. Uh, it's a good thing to do. Um, and the best thing, it's free. 
And so you can get some free advice on whether a particular food you want to use or an ingredient you want to put in your foods um, is considered novel or not. And so there's guidance material on our website, and I believe in the PDF that Jenny sent out, these hyperlinks will take you straight there. If not, um, just go onto our website and type novel foods in the search box. So here are some examples of foods considered by the ACNF. So the first one, they're D-allulose. So this is what the table looks like, and uh, it's a Word document on our website. And so the outcome view there was that it was a, non, a non-traditional food, uh, but a novel food. And so in that instance, it, it, has to, it has to be either non-traditional or not novel to be permitted as a general food. So if it doesn't meet both being non-traditional and novel, uh, or traditional and novel, sorry, um, it, it can uh, be considered a novel food and, and so therefore may require a, a, an assessment. And so as far as the deallulose is going, the, the, the view there was that there was no tradition, traditional use of deallulose as a food in this region, which is correct. The safety was not established and um, the view is that it requires an assessment of proposed patterns and levels of use before it can be sold as a food in this region. And so there was a potential for adverse effects in humans at high level of intake. So since this view has been published, we've actually received a, um, an application for D-allulose or, or D-piscos as it's more commonly known. Um, and so for those of you who don't know, this is the wonder ingredient, so not that I'm promoting it. So it's a low calorie sweetener. It's about 70% as sweet as sucrose, but the, the great thing about it is it only has 10% of the calories, but it has all those other functional properties that sugar has, such as um, uh, participating in the Maillard reaction in the browning and all, also viscositizes and it sweetens, and so it adds body. So it's, it's, it has the functionality of sugar pretty much, um, but with only 10% of the calories. And so we're working through that application at the moment and uh, we'll perhaps, if that gets accepted, or uh, that will be gazetted towards the end of the year. So we're looking at taking that one to the board in August. So if you look at the August board meeting and then go 60 days after that, um, you're looking around about October. Next one there is dairy mineral concentrate. So this one was a, looks like a proprietary product, lactosalt opti taste. So the view there was that this was a non-traditional food, uh, but not a novel food. And so a non-traditional food in Australia and New Zealand in, context, in the context presented. And so it's about how the food is proposed to be used. So there's a lot of consideration that goes into these views. And, and again, it's about how the food is used, at what levels, and, and you know, what types of consumers would have it. Are there vulnerable consumers likely to have it? Those sorts of things. Uh, and the isolation and concentration of milk minerals and subsequent additional other foods is not consistent with the history of consumption of dairy products. However, there, there was no safety concerns identified. It was just that the use was non-traditional. Next one down there, there's, there's a few bifidobacterium species and they were seen as a traditional food and not a novel food. So as far as this one um, is concerned, they were able to be um, marketed or the advice was there that um, an application wasn't required. And that's because there's a long history of exposure to bifidobacterium in fermented foods and breast milk. And so bifidobacterium are also used as a probiotic in complementary medicines. So there's your history of safe use. And I threw an interesting one in there at the bottom. So hydrolyzed keratin from sheep slime. I know we like sheep here in New Zealand. Um, and so this was to um, use the, the, the protein for the wool as, as a source of food. Um, and the view there that it was a non-traditional food, which is, seems quite obvious on the face of it, and it was a novel food. And so the justification there was that sheep's wool is not a traditional food source. Safety is not established. And in this instance, the product was not adequately characterized. So they would have needed to provide more information um, had they gone to, to make an application. We certainly haven't seen an application for that one yet. Okay, I'll look at a couple of case studies now. So application A1175, some of you may be familiar with this one. 
And so this is an application to permit rapeseed or canola protein isolate as a novel food. And the brand name there was Canola Pro. So this was submitted in 2019 by DSM. And it was assessed as a general application. So general level means there's one round of public consultation. As I mentioned before, we always do public consultations. If it's a major application, uh, there are two rounds of public consultation. So they, that would be a very complex ingredient that would require a major application. So in the main, a novel food would be a general application. And so therefore, only one round of public consultation um, would be needed. And the applicant told us that if all the canola protein in the world was used for human consumption, it could provide enough protein for 500 million people, which I, I think is quite an impressive statistic. And so what is the protein isolate? So it's extracted from the rapeseed cake. So it's a byproduct from rapeseed oil production. And um, it's traditionally used for animal feed. So what they've done, once they've pressed the seed, they've got this cake left in there. And so they've come up with a way of, of extracting the, the protein isolate from that. So it's, a, it's like a powder, this this one, and it can be used as a source of proteins. Uh, for example, as you would a pea po protein or a soy protein powder to, to boost the protein levels perhaps in a food. And it, so it provides a substantial, a sustainable source of high nutrition value protein, a smooth mouthfeel, which is good, and a good to taste profile, which is good also, and a desirable functional properties, which is, so there's three really good things that it provides this one. It's intended to be used as a protein source in a wide range of food applications, similar to the use of animal soy or pea proteins. Um, and so I've got a couple of photos here, and it might be, quite local to some of you folks so this this is um in cowra and and so when the um canola is in flower the the sydney siders flock down there and and they 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 go through the fields and um frolic around and get their photos taken and, and the far, as far as the farmers are concerned i suppose they don't mind but they either harvest the crop uh for oil or they they feed it to the stock and uh this particular year the um the price of stock feed was up, so they actually um, use it for stock feed. And so what were the challenges with application A1175? So obviously we had to look at which standards applied to the rapeseed protein isolate. And so novel food, as I mentioned, Schedule 25, um, which lists the permitted novel foods and their conditions of use. So it's in the table there at the moment. There was a no primary source specification in Schedule 3 identity and impurity, as I mentioned before. So we had to write a specification, and, and that's from the manufacturer's specification that gets written. Uh, and again, so that's in Schedule 3. So that anyone using that ingredient knows it must adhere to that particular specification. Uh, and now it is permitted in food, excluding infant formula products and food for infants. So just on that, if, if a food's to be permitted in infant formula products or well, food for infants, it needs a, a, an extra level of um, assessment from Fizans. So the extra safeguards that we have to put in place. And safety risks, so uh, it's part of the mustard family. So mustard... Uh, allergic individuals may react to rape seeds. However, mustard is not a recognised allergen in New Zealand and Australia, so it does uh, pose a problem. So we've got communication on our website um, to, to let consumers know that if you have a, an allergy to mustard that you may be affected by rape, rape seed, uh, the rapeseed protein. And does it pose a microbiological risk for some foods that don't undergo a final microbiocidal step. So, for example, if you had a, a muesli bar that you wanted to boost the protein and you put some in and there, there wasn't a kill step in there, so would it be safe to consume um, for foods that didn't have any heating or, or anything like that? And we, and we found that it was. Incidentally, um, with this application, the company that was producing, they were still producing in a pilot plant. So, and, and that did pose a risk in so much as that when they scale up to a, to a normal um, uh, factory production size, it needs to be the exact same product that they've had permission for. So they can't go tweaking it and add other ingredients because it takes it away from what we've assessed. And then we looked at the dietary exposure of the anti-nutritional factors, the phytates, uh, uric acid, and glucosinolates. 
Um, because again, as I mentioned, they get concentrated into the product and we found the exposure was, was minimal as was the exposure to metals. Managing risk, so we had a fact sheet on our website which has been published to ensure that the mustard allergic individual are aware of the, the uh, potential risk from rapeseed protein isolate. Included microbiological testing specification in Schedule 3. So again, if, if someone wanted to use that, they, they look at the micro parameters and um, just to make sure it's safe. Uh, we included a maximum permitted level for phytates, uricic acid, and glucosinolates, and we found that the metal exposure was similar to normal the normal daily consumption of, of brassica. So, so this one got approved. Uh, I might also say there that, that we're still continuing to work with the Australian Society of, of Clinical Immunology and Allergy, um, and Allergy New Zealand, New Zealand and Energy. Allergy and Anaphylaxis Australia. So we 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 um, touch base with them every now and then just to see if they've had any um, inquiries about this product. And we're also monitoring the food supply to see who is using it. Uh, and at this stage, we haven't found anyone using it. Maybe they're still building that production plant. I'm not sure. So here's another one, which is an interesting one we did. Uh, again, this was submitted in 2019 by Impossible Foods. So this was the soy leg hemoglobin and the Impossible Burger. So this was assessed as a major. So this had two rounds of public consultation. And this is a paid one. So um, it, depending on the amount of hours, so just in terms of, of when you pay it, the, 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 the um, payment is calculated by the complexity. So our staff do what's called an admin assessment and we calculate how many hours each staff member will need on it. So those hours get totaled up and we charge $154 an hour. So this one here would have been uh, the top level for a general application, 680 hours. And so that's 680 times 145. And so you're getting it well up over $150,000. And and this one was a fair bit uh, more because it was it was a fairly complex um, application. And so what is soy leg hemoglobin? Globin? So it's synthesized from a GM uh, modified yeast, uh, Pitcher pastoris, which expresses the leg hemoglobin gene from soybean nodules. So... If you look just here, so there's the soybean plant, and then down here you've got the root, and on the on the root there's little nodules, and if you break them open, they're pink inside, and and that's the soy leg hemoglobin just sitting in there, and so, um, Impossible Foods, their philosophy is was that they didn't want to plant out fields and fields of of um, of soybeans, so what they wanted to do is is um, get a yeast to produce that um, leg hemoglobin. And so what they've done, they've, they've inserted, they've taken the DNA from those soy plants and inserted it into a genetically modified yeast, which was fermented. So, so the yeast just lives in, in the fermentation media and it consumes the sugar and it pumps out the, the, um, the soy leg hemoglobin. And so it's added in a liquid preparation to meet analog products. So when I say meat analog products, that's plant-based meat and the like. That's our nice regulatory name for things that aren't meat. Uh, and so this is it here in the little bowl up here. And so it's like quite a thick, um, it's, oh, I wouldn't say syrupy, but it's, it's quite a thick liquid in the dark and it does look a bit like blood. And obviously that's what it's designed to look like. And so they mix it with all these other ingredients. So they've got um, obviously water they have in there, some soy protein concentrate, coconut oil, sunflower oil. So there's some flavors in there. Um, there's some potato protein, ethocellulose, some yeast extract. So there's a lot of other ingredients. And what Impossible Foods also had to consider is that these other ingredients, um, whether they were permitted by the food standards code, because all we were permitting was this, this liquid up here. And particularly with if they were using soy protein concentrate and being an American company, most of the um, soy is probably GM over there. So it would have to be one of the GM permitted soys permitted in the code for this region. So in this instance, we don't necessarily um, assess the final food, which would be the burger patty or the mince, but the, the, um, the unique component of it. 
And the purpose of the leg hemoglobin is to replicate the nutrition as a source of iron and, and, and also the flavor and aroma of the myoglobin found in the muscle, uh, meat muscle of um, animals. And it's very nice too, I might add. Although I, I tend to, to, to cook it because, I, I mean, over here, we, there was a, um, a lot of noise around restaurants serving um, medium rare or rare burger patties. And, and so New Zealand Food Safety um, put out a, a directive that that wasn't a good idea um, because of the E. coli risk. And so what they did, interestingly enough, they said, well, well a restaurant, restaurant can serve a, a rare uh, burger patty, but what they have to do is, is cook a whole steak, cook it on the outside, sear it off, and then dice it finely, and then turn that into a burger patty, and there's your, there's your rare or medium rare. So they've come up with a unique way of doing it. And some of the people I've spoken to have, have actually had an impossible burger, and some of you may have had it that um, they find it a bit meaty and a bit bloody and particularly if you're a vegetarian it can be quite off-putting so yeah they've done a really good job of, of replicating you know, what a meat product would be challenges so which standards apply to the soy leg hemoglobin so is it a novel food or a food produced using gene technology or a nutritive substance or a food additive because it does add color as well and so the way the code is structured is that if something is genetically modified, it gets assessed as a GM food. So that trumps it being a novel fo a food. Even though it is novel, uh, if it's, there's a GM component, it, it gets assessed as a GM food. And so did we need to look at the final meat analog or product more broadly? So as I mentioned before, um, Impossible Foods had to have regard to all the other ingredients they are putting in there to make sure they were approved um, in the code. As far as the safety goes, uh, we had to consider whether we were assessing the safety of the leg hemoglobin or the preparation or both. And so the preparation has, it's pretty much the cell biomass. So it's not a highly concentrated um, substance. So there's a lot of dead cell matter and cell lysate in there. And the protein contents are it's only around about 14% of that liquid. So there's a lot of other stuff floating around in there as well. And so we had to consider what level of data or information re we required to complete our assessment. So there was a lot of toing and froing, and this quite often happens in an application that uh, we have more questions as, as we go further on and, and look into it further. And we also looked at the um, bioavailability of the iron. So how does it compare to iron from meat? Is it absorbed in, in, in the same way as it is from animal sources? And so the drafting, which is the way it appears in the code, is it's not a GM whole food. And so we had to have a, a new table in the code to regulate GM substances. Uh, managing stakeholder concerns. So one of the big ones, obviously, and, and which is the labeling and, and risk of misleading consumers. So would consumers buy this thinking it was actual meat? And it does look very much like meat, but uh, we had to um, ensure that the labeling was such that um, people didn't think it was actual, actually meat. What were the iron levels? Would a consumer think that they, if they changed solely from um, to the Impossible Burger from meat, would they get the same amount of iron or would they be misled? Or would they expect they'd be getting the same amount of iron, but they wouldn't be? And so we there was evidence required to support public health and safety. And we looked at the nutritional impact of fortified meat analog products more broadly. And so this one got approved. So that the process for that one was around about a year and a half. And at the time of approving that approval, they'd actually sold over 100 million burgers. And, and so that was getting on for three years ago. So I'd hate to think how many they've, they've served now. Okay, in terms of making an inquiry, where do we start? So the steps for determining whether a food is novel. So if you're sitting there and you've got something on your mind, um, the first thing is to check the food standards code. So there's a hyperlink, go to our food standards code to see if the food's permitted. If not, if you, or if you can't find it, you can obtain a view as to whether the food is novel from the relevant food enforcement agency. So that's the state and territory jurisdictions in Australia or MPI here in New Zealand. So um, again, on our website, we've got a, a, a link to those food enforcement agencies. So you can contact them directly and go straight to the um, 
appropriate person. Or you can obtain independent legal advice, which you'd pay for. The first two are free, so uh, start there. And, and then if you, if you can't find it, you can always get uh, legal advice. However, uh, sometimes we struggle to find uh, uh, food lawyers that um, are, I, I suppose that deal with things like novel food. So, but the the food enforcement agencies um, they're very afraid with novel foods. And in fact, some of them are on the the ACNF, the Committee for Novel Foods. In any case, and so I've spoken about them a little bit before. So you can check the record of view. So there's uh, several hundred. Rec- um, substances in the record of views, and these are formed in response to novel food inquiries um, over the past 20 years or so. If there's no record, and so what you can do is you can fill out a questionnaire and email it to the ACNF at Food Standards. So you can actually fill out a questionnaire and um, you can get your food assessed and, and you can have your own view. And again, that's all free. And the committee meets several times a year and, and we give that view on whether a food is novel or not. And as I mentioned before, it's not uh, legal advice that they're provided only to help inquirers make their own decision on whether they should submit an application to amend the code. And that's up to the applicant. I mean, the risk is on them. If, if they um, have a view from the ACNF and it says make an application, well, they don't have to. Uh, it's voluntary. But the, again, the risk is on the um, on the company that decides to um, market a food that hasn't had a pre-market assessment. And if there's no recommend, the no recommendations are provided if there's insufficient information uh, to assess that food. Steps in making the application. So, again, contact us, email or, or phone us up, um, and and have a look at the pre-application assistance on our website. There's a lot, and it's pretty much steps you through the whole way. Read the Fazan's application handbook. Read through section two, which is a general application information which every application uh, must fill out and um, also pay particular attention to sections 3.1 general requirements and 3.5.2 novel foods and so they just step you through what requirements you need uh, to make an application and so I've, I've, I've bolded and I t- italicized must because when it says must in the handbook that must be provided obviously um, there are shoulds and musts in the handbook so uh, when you see a must that, that has to be there and the other good thing to do is look at examples of novel food applications on our website, though. There's some examples. All our applications have a number, as I mentioned. So 11, 23, 24, they're the DHA alcohol oils, and 75 and, and 86. I've spoken about those uh, just prior to this. And the main thing is that if you make, a, make an application, a draft application, is, I suggest that it's a great thing to do. It needs to be a thorough draft and not just a working draft so it has, has to be pretty much finalized and then what you can submit the draft application and we'll provide comment on that application if the data requirements are met the application can be formally submitted and there are just some more hyperlinks so they'll be in the uh, pdf that jenny sent out so the novel foods acnf record abuse and the application handbook and that's it, folks. I'll leave that up there just for a second. So, um, look, I, I'm happy to, to, to spend time on the phone with anyone or, or you're welcome to send me an email and um, we'll set you on the right track. Great. Thanks, everyone. I'll leave it there. Wow. Thanks so much, Ben. That's great. Okay. So we've got a couple of questions that are there. If anybody else has got questions, can you type them into the chat box now, please? It might be a certain thing you want to know more about, but um, are you right there with your chat box, Ben? Yeah, I've got a couple of questions here. Kirsty, thank you, Kirsty. Um, what type of information does the Advisory Committee on Novel Foods require for a review of the ingredients? Um, is it a PIF form? Thank you. So as I mentioned, uh, there's a questionnaire. So if you, if you go to our website and search up Novel Foods, the Advisory Committee on Novel Foods, you will find um, a questionnaire that can be filled out. And so um, take a copy of that, fill out all the information, and um, there's a fair bit to do. So it's, it's, it's not a simple thing to do. Um, there's a bit of looking around. Um, but, yeah, it's fairly self-explanatory, so I hope that answers that question. Lauren, how are you? Um, so Lauren's question is, will cell country 
cultured foods happening overseas, sell cultured chicken in Singapore, buy milk in Israel. Is Fizan's considering how these kinds of foods could come under the Food Standards Code as a novel food assessment? Uh, it's a really good question and, and really topical and yes and yes. So we are doing some thinking about that at the moment. Um, so we've had many inquiries uh, yeah, from all around the world in, in terms of the regulation around uh, cultural foods and we've spoken at length with uh, Singapore Food Agency and also um, the USFDA they've just recently um, assessed the upside foods uh, chicken product and so so we, we're communicating with these other regulatory agencies around the world so we're in a position um, where we feel we're ready to assess a, a cell cultured uh, product and as the code stands um, it would be assessed as a novel food. Now, there may be down the track, uh, we do some work within chapters three and four, the primary production, but uh, we're doing some thinking around that and we're really looking forward to um, getting something coming through the door. Yes. Our next question is Deirdre. Thanks for a great presentation. That's all right. Glad to see I'm on the right track when lecturing undergraduates about novel foods. Oh, well, that's good. And look, yeah, don't be backward and coming forward because you know we have some of our staff here that can do a talk for students because when I think back to university, I had to think of how many years ago, but it's one of those things that sometimes doesn't get covered. And and we have a staff member here that travels down to Otago University and she does a lecture on, on food regulation. So um, yeah, that's something for anyone in um, universities that if their students need help, um, yeah, look, yeah, we can come up with a presentation. We, we can find someone to do one. That, that's fine. Thank you so and, much, Ben, because we'd love to host one of your, um, you know, colleagues, particularly being, so I'm from the University of Queensland, so mm -hmm. very much, you know, here in Brisbane, we would love to host one of your colleagues as a guest lecturer. So I'll be contacting you about um, that in terms of getting, you know. Oh, yeah. Look, do that. Yeah. And, oh, we might even have a staff member in Queensland. Oh, fabulous. I can, I can shoulder tap them. Yeah, oh, okay. brilliant. So I'll email you to sort of be directed in the right direction. Thanks a lot, Ben. Okay, great. Thanks, Deirdre. Uh, Miriam, so if a food is classified by the advisory committee as non-traditional but not novel, does it mean no application is required? Yeah, that, that's right. So it needs to be, meet both of those criteria of, of uh, being not novel and, and being... Traditional, so it has to have a traditional use. So the question there is, uh, I'll just read it out again, is if a food is classified by advisory committee as non-traditional but not novel, does it mean uh, an application is required? So in that instance, it's, it's a, there's no traditional use of it in this region, so it will need an assessment. And so it has to meet both the criteria. So it has to be um, not novel, but it has to be have a traditional history of safe use in this region. And so sometimes it might meet one of the criteria and, and vice versa, but it needs to be both of those of being traditional and not novel. Scroll down here, folks. So uh, Mark's got a question. Fermentation bacteria, e.g. starter cultures or biocontrol cultures as novel foods seems to be on a strain-by-strain strain basis. But is Fizan's looking at providing blanket coverage of grass microorganisms in foods uh, like in Europe? That's a really good question, Mark. Um, yeah, we have some work underway um, where we might assess them differently. It, we go down to the um, strain level at the moment. Um, so if there's a um, if there's a history of safe use for, for, a, for a species, it may be in the future that we, we don't go down to the strain. So we just assess at that higher level. And so we're doing some work on that at the moment. And so that's been ongoing for a while. And, and we understand that in Europe they do that. And it seems to be working quite successfully over there. And this is a big area for, um, for the deer industry, obviously. Um, so look, I just advise, yeah, just just to keep, you know, if you if you've got uh, more uh, microorganisms, send them into the ACNF and and keep an eye on our website for proposals because if if we do um, make a, a blanket change on how we assess those microorganisms, that'll be raised as a Fazan's proposal. So anyone will have a chance to um, comment on that. 
And that's about it. Um, how are we going for time? We've got a few more minutes. Yep. I've got another couple of questions, which I... Um, so I, um, Jenny sent through some questions and um, one of them was, when using in ingredients that are not commonly used, e.g. herbal extracts, cherry blossom extract, um, carthamus, L-theanine, et cetera, and when, are they, when they are not listed in the Advisory Committee on Novel Foods list or the food standards goes, how do we determine these ingredients if they're permitted? So um, when and how is the line drawn between being a food, novel food versus an ingredient or an additive? So there's a couple of questions there. So again, approach the ACNF and, and there's so many substances that uh, we deal with. So it's hard to give a view uh, off the top of my head that, yeah, you know, those things, uh, L-theanine, I think that's in there now in the record of views. Um, but interesting question between drawing the line between a novel food and an ingredient or, or an additive. So a novel food is something that's new to this region or, or doesn't have a history of safe use, uh, where a general ingredient um, is one that has a history of safe use. So a lot of things like a lot of vegetables, they're just generally permitted. In fact, we, they don't even need regulation. Um, they're, they're just used. Um, when something's a food additive, so that has a technological function, and so in the code, there's specific technological functions, say, for example, uh, preservative, emulsifier, a colorant, things like that. So they fit under those categories. And so they're regulated under Schedule 15 or 16 of the code. And so they may be um, permitted only in certain food classes, um, or they may have a general per permission at, at um, GMP usage levels. So Schedule in 15 and 16 have the food additives, and they, they are specific – to um, the function that they provide within a food. Another question, oh, would milk in which minor components, e.g. lactoferrin, have been removed be considered a novel food? Um, now, this is an interesting one. So the intent of removing the minor components is not to standardise, but to purify and dry for use in other products. How would the depleted milk be considered? So without knowing more details on this product, on how much it is actually moved and what the depleted milk is used for or sold as, we, we can't really um, provide a view. I mean, that would have to go to the ACNF. Um, also, yeah, maybe that consumer law comes into play because if it's being sold as milk but it doesn't contain all the components or they've been diminished somewhat from standardised milk, um, the consumer could be misled to thinking that they're consuming milk, perhaps. Um, and so this would be one, I think, to, to send to the enforcement agency. So by all means, uh, you know, if you've got a question like that, go on to our website. Um, you can ask us. And the funny thing about Fazans is that we, we don't enforce the code. So I'm unable under the Fazans Act to um, interpret the code. But the, the interpretation role is, is carried out by the jurisdiction. So... Again, go onto our website and look for the enforcement contacts. Wow. There's a lot, lot, lot involved there, Ben. Well, that seems to be all our questions for now. <clears throat> I wish to thank you all for attending today and for all your questions. It always makes for good conversation towards the end of our webinar. Thank you, Ben, um, sharing your professional knowledge with Australian dairy manufacturers, greatly appreciated by the industry. Great. Thanks. Happy to help.